Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second installment of Breaking Bread in McLean County. My name is Julie Emig, and I am the executive director of the McLean County uh, Museum of History. Uh, today, we're presenting From Johnny Cakes to Patty Cakes, Irish Cookery. And just to give you a little bit more context about the series, um, this is the second one in a 10-part program. We are going to extend through November of this year. We are in partnership between the museum, Be In Welcoming, which is a coalition of the Immigration Project, Not In Our Town, Not In Our Schools, the West Bloomington Revitalization Project, the Mennonite Church of Normal, First United Methodist Church, and we are also delighted to be working in partnership with Design Streak at Illinois State University. In this series about the immigrant experience in McLean County, we will continue to learn from our local residents. What kinds of relationships are forged when immigrants venture to a new land and what tensions arise? Immigrant stories will be experienced in the context of food, hence breaking bread as a metaphor of a common staple we share across cultures while also recognizing important and distinct variation. Um, look forward to learning the recipes today as we engage with our speakers. Uh, when I reflect on my own experience of um, the Irish immigrant experience uh, of that, that sort of journey to this country, um, I'm taken back to my days working in the Boston public schools and in neighborhoods in Southie. And I got to know a fellow named Ronnie Miller who's the executive director of the Irish International Immigration Center. And we spent a lot of time conversing about that reciprocal relationship of culture between what happened when this huge Irish culture transplanted itself in the heart of Boston and how they influenced one another. It was really interesting to, to get to know the families there and hear their stories. So I am delighted to introduce everyone around me today for this event. Uh, Greg Coos is going to be orchestrating the experience, and he is uh, a historian and exec emeritus executive director of the museum. Um, we have mus musician Bill Gibbons. We have Dan Brady from the House, Illinois House of Representatives, and we have musician um, Bill Williams. You will also be hearing a treat from Morita and Chrissy Way's Mom's Supper and additional recipes throughout the program. And I just wanna remind everybody um, to please utilize the Q&A feature to submit questions throughout the program uh, in the chat and we will address at the end. We will also uh, record the program and make it public for later viewing. Thank you so much. I look forward to learning from all of you today. Thank you, Julie. The, um, I went, I just have warned everybody of something that's really important and that is that, I, this part of this is my family story that I'll bring into this, but what you really need to understand is that I went to a Catholic high school, and in that high school, audiovisual was a nun with a very, very loud voice. And so if there are some errors here, uh, it is because of that uh, uh, experience of trying to uh, work with these kinds of forms of media. From Johnny Cakes to Patty Cakes, Irish immigration into McLean County. The woman you see on the, uh, on the right is Mary Motherway O'Neill. She brought her nine children over at the time of the famine. She's my great-great-grandmother, and it's from her stalwart efforts to resettle her family into McLean County that much of my interest in history stems. So in a sense, parts of this are autobiographical. Um, in a sense, another sense, as the anthropologist would call it, there is a touch of participant observer in this, that not only am I participating, but I'm also observing these communities as I participate in them. We're going to be looking at uh, different aspects of the Irish experience. We're gonna be looking at the first Irish immigrants uh, who came into McLean County, who were Irish Presbyterians or Scots-Irish people who were really our first settlers. I will then look at Irish Catholic immigrants who were famine immigrants. They came from a push factor. They were pushed out of Ireland by starvation and they came into central Illinois, came in the United States. I'll be asking what, what issues did these folks face? 
what kinds of things uh, were they looking at in terms of dealing with these new lands or dealing with the, whether it's new lands that they were occupying in Illinois or from Kentucky or, or however they came. Well, as a food series, of course, we're gonna look at what did they eat and what they ate in many cases does represent some important and long-term parts of their story. The, your food way, in a sense, is a real core aspect of your humanity and how you've lived it. And we'll explore these with the help of Bill Givens, Dan Brady, and Bill Williams, who you will meet later in this. The Scots-Irish uh, left, and who are they, I guess? We need to ask, who, who are the Scots-Irish? Well, these are Scots Presbyterians who left, uh, who were resettled, if you will, the lowland areas of Scotland into Ulster as an effort to break the back of the Catholic Kings of Ireland. And so it was a plantation system and the sense of people being moved onto new lands and setting up farming. Uh, these folks started doing this in uh, the mid 17th century. And approximately 100 years later, they started leaving. And so the question is why? And the answer is because, uh, this is a bigoted statement on my part. It said that uh, the sun shall never set on a British empire because God would never trust them in the dark. The English hierarchy persecuted these Presbyterians because they were not Church of England. So there was a religious bigotry that they were suffering under. A second piece was that they were in the textile business in the sense of making home textiles and selling them. And the uh, internal tariffs were created, which really started breaking the back of their cash economy. And so in the period of 1720 to 1776, over 350,000 Scots Presbyterians from Northern Ireland came to North America. And uh, at times, entire villages would pack up and get a boat and leave. And typically, what they did was they would land in Philadelphia, Wilmington, Delaware, Charleston, South Carolina. Philadelphia was the largest port of entry for these folks. And as they moved into Pennsylvania, they found that the lands, the good lands, the low lands, were, had been settled up already. And so they were, by economic necessity, pushed up into the Appalachian Mountains. And as part of that, they decided to move further down because they were every all these people were looking for a place to to live they're looking for a place to farm they're looking for a place to restart their lives so traveling through the shenandoah river or through the shenandoah valley into virginia north carolina and then in the early 19th century crossing the appalachian mountains into kentucky tennessee ohio and indiana oh, through the ohio river so essentially it was a voyage, a constant kind of movement. Now, in terms of understanding who these folks are, maybe a classic Southern or Scots-Irish person would be Andrew Jackson, president of the United States, old hickory. His face is such a typical Scots-Irish face, his attitudes uh, typical, his, his easy anger. Uh, his demands in terms of representing his family's life and protecting his wife's reputation. And then Jane Britton Hendricks is the first Scots-Irish woman to come into McLean County. And she grew up in North Carolina. So her parents and her grandparents were part of that movement. Now, how they lived was that, and how, and how do I wanna put this? The, the experience of these folks was formed by high levels of violence and their ways of doing their ways of organizing their culture were based upon the physical insecurity that they were experiencing and so when they made a house they made it from stuff that was at hand and could be easily replaced and easily repaired now that high level of violence was a result of their experience as lowland scots who were in an area of constant warfare between the British and the Highland Scots. Uh, they were also as being people who were moved from Scotland into Ireland, kind of uh, shock troops, if you will, of the English movement to break uh, the Irish Catholic state. 
So, so this background of, of uh, families hanging together uh, was, was extremely important. When they made clothing, they made clothing from what they could produce on their own. So fierce independence of the extended family was incredibly important in their formation. Who was kin was really important to know because kin was somebody that you could actually rely upon in these times which in their minds were a con constantly around them, these times of unsettlement, these times of uncertainty. Um, and this notion of kinhood, of whose cousin goes out to five generations. I've often thought that this is one of the things that has really driven the American genealogical movement is this importance, this, this, this drive to know who, who are you related to. Their faith, was a celebration through intense preaching experienced at outdoor revivals. Their faith was based on very strong emotional bonds of faith. Uh, the great Methodist uh, uh, preacher, Peter Cartwright is an exemplar of a Scots-Irish way of, of worship. Uh, Cartwright practiced what I call broad-fisted Christianity. He'd say if the devil gets out of me, out of you, and gets into me, brother. You are in for a beating. So he was he was very forceful in that sense. Um, another aspect of of uh, the experience of these folks was that oral culture. Oral culture was extraordinarily important, and oral culture was in many ways considered to be superior to the text. Now, part of that is because of the scarcity of paper and the scarcity of text, oral culture was the best way by which you could pass on the truths that you know. And so coming out of this was emotion was true. Um, lies could be found in text, not including the Bible. The food ways of Scots-Irish reflect that story of, temp of a temporary self-sustaining kind of group of people. Johnny Cakes is a very, as we've taken from the title, Johnny Cakes is, is the classic in a sense. It's a flat bread, uh, you bake it on a griddle, and it came, uh, and what do you use? Well, in, in Scotland, you'd use oats, and you'd pound oats or grind oats and make this flat kind of cake and cook it on a griddle. Well, in North America, corn is a much more successful kind of grain. And so you would pound dried corn or you'd pound hominy. And hominy is very interesting, lye soaked corn that actually grows because of the lye soaking actually gains a significant amount of nutritional value. It's actually better for you than, uh, than the yellow corn. And of course the name, why do they call it Johnny cake? It's from the Scots Johnnock, which means journey and becomes Johnny. It keeps well and preservation of food, how do you keep food when you don't have refrigeration is an important aspect of the foods that these folks were eating, very typical. Clabber milk or bonnie clabber was a food that would be like buttermilk with sour curds. Now, when we think, there's been a great deal, if you read 19th century writing, clabber milk is considered to be absolutely indigestible and just absolutely terrible. Well, a lot of people felt that about yogurt when it was first being introduced into our diet. And a lot of people still feel that way about buttermilk. Um, but those bacteria infused dairy products are a type of preservation. And so they were keeping milk by doing that. Pork was the preferred meat. And the reason for this is that in the upland areas, pork was a favored kind of animal to raise because it could range in the woods. It, it could wander in the woods and root up roots, eat acorns, and, and make a very lean, a very, very tasteful meat. And in terms of cooking pork, uh, essentially two ways of doing it. If you have it fresh, uh, you can fry it or you broil it or boil it, I mean. Okay, so, uh, but you don't always have, can't keep fresh pork that long. And so you preserve it by smoking it or salting it. And so thus becomes this key piece of diet, which we all enjoy, of either ham or bacon. Um, I'd like to think that a huge part of our love for bacon is coming out of the Irish uh, use of smoking uh, the pork that they were raising. Scots-Irish would, of course, eat field greens. Um, 
The classic field greens are called ramps, and ramps are a wild onion that grows in the timber. And ramps are right now one of the hottest gourmet items uh, with the uh, foodie folks. Uh, ramps bring a huge price. You know, uh, there's uh, the Spence Farm up in uh, Livingston County has quite a wild uh, ramp uh, production today. A uh, garden truck. What's a garden truck? Truck is the stuff you produce out of a garden. And uh, Upland Southern folk or Scots Irish uh, would grow the Indian three sisters, squash, beans, and corn. And so this is a piece where they learn from the Shawnee or they learn from the other Native Americans with whom they were associating with, uh, taking, getting seed from them uh, for these crops and learning how to cook them uh, and observing what the Indians knew, which was that squash, beans, and corn, when served together, prov provide a complete protein. So it's a very, very good kind of thing to have. And then finally, uh, an important food was whiskey. Uh, whiskey defined in many ways uh, the notion of self-sufficiency because not only can you ferment the grain and distill it into a high level of alcohol, which has value on its own, uh, whiskey drinking becomes an aspect of manly behavior. It's a manly thing to do, but also very importantly, it is easier to convert, convert corn into whiskey and sell the whiskey and get that whiskey shipped over the Appalachian Mountains than it is to try to drive a uh, herd of hogs over the Appalachian Mountains. And so this notion of making whiskey goes to how do you convert your, the grain that you're growing into something that you can cash out. Now, moving into McLean County, uh, Upland Southern folks, or Scots-Irish, were moving and still do move into McLean County, but I'll be looking at the period 1820 to 1900. Those Scots-Irish pioneers were moving into what was called the Sangmo country. It was an area of, defined by the uh, watershed of the Sangamon River. It was known as a place that was lush that had a good mixture of savanna lands that are easy to build and farm in, of uh, deep timber, which is good for hunting. Uh, when they came, they were up into central Illinois and in southern Illinois. Th their settlement was opposed by the Kickapoo. And the Kickapoo uh, were, by federal policy, forced out of McLean County. And the person who wrote that federal policy, who drove that federal policy, who enforced that federal policy was President Andrew Jackson. So when Jackson was creating the Trail of Tears, he was at the same time was working on programs to get rid of the Kickapoo and other Indians out of the Illinois Territory and out of the Sangmo Territory. James Allen, who is the founder of Bloomington, is, is Scots-Irish. And there is a letter of reference that he carried that's in the archives of the McLean County Museum of History. And that letter states through a sense of a negative of what kind of person James Allen was. Said he didn't get drunk, he didn't fight, he didn't lie, he didn't steal. And so what that letter of reference was saying was that he had, he had no personal connection, no family connection. He was on his own, so he had to have something. It's almost like a cultural passport to say that his reputation was good because it's family and the family connections that drove reputation and that helped people understand who was who. It was a way of sorting out, can you trust somebody? Uh, can you not trust them? Is that a good family? Is that a bad family? So the family structure that is part of that whole experience became an important part of the political structure. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was, of course, one of our Scots-Irish presidents, joked about that, uh, about family reputation, uh, with his wife, uh, Mary Todd, where he observed um, somebody asked about Mary Todd, and he says, well, or about the Todds. He says, let me tell you about the Todds. He says, one D is good enough for God. Now, the Scots-Irish middle class 
started coming up into McLean County in the, from the 1830s well into the 1850s. And what drove them to migrate? Because migration is a push factor and a pull factor. And so with these Scots-Irish middle class, you can see the push factor is slave power. Many of these people were independent grain producers. Uh, they were independent stock raisers. They were independent tobacco raisers. And they were running their own farms with their own families. They were not slave owners. And slave power by organization of large capitalized farms and a, lar and a heavily capitalized local economy pushed these kinds of farmers out. So they needed to escape the, the, the oppression of slavery also was oppressing them economically. That was the push. The poll was in 1854, Bloomington got two railroads at the same time. McLean County got two railroads at the same time. So there was a booming railroad economy. And that booming railroad economy was a great attraction. Money could be made. It could be made by people such as young Adley Stevenson, who was grandfather of the man who ran for the presidency in 1948 and 19, or I mean 1952 and 1956. He was governor of Illinois in 1848. His grandfather, Adley Stevenson, um, came into McLean County to be a lawyer, to make money as a lawyer, went into politics as a Democrat, and became uh, through climbing through what's called the bourbon democracy, which I'm not going to get deeply into. It didn't, it had a little bit to do with drinking bourbon, but it had more to do with uh, an insult to bourbon kings. But in any case, Stevenson grew through that politically, through that democratic uh, policy and democratic party politics and became vice president of the United States in 1892. So as a Scots-Irish middle class, he rose into the upper middle class. The group who came in the 1870s to 1900 were Scots-Irish agricultural workers. These folks were coming up to help at harvest time, when it was time to shuck corn, uh, to help at planting time. So they were seasonal, very seasonal in the sense of when their work was uh, under demand. And when they were not, their work was not under demand and they needed to move on to the next uh, job, they were considered to be hobos uh, or tramps. Uh, and they were subject to police harassment because the popular, it's interesting, the popular image of a worker, and you're seeing a photo of one, Marion's hired hand, the popular image was they were a person that you needed when you needed them, and when you didn't need them, you saw them as a threat to your family and a threat to your personal wealth because they'd rob you. So it was just, they were it was a, like a day and night, almost a psychosis of American society about these, this, these traveling agricultural workers. They dealt with it. Their goal as workers were to become a resident farmhand, that is not to have to travel, to actually be, be, be given a room in the farmhouse where they could then work at a salary. And then perhaps after really getting to know everybody, maybe they could rent their own farm and become a tenant and with a great deal of luck and whatnot, perhaps even own a McLean County farm. So there was a way up and a way out, um, but there was a tremendous amount of uh, bigotries and false expectations about who these folks were. Now, a person whose family experienced much of this is Bill Gibbons. And Bill was a longtime city employee. He's a very accomplished musician, as you will soon see. He's a family historian. His mother came out of Kentucky and his father came out of Pennsylvania. And Bill's going to talk about bread pudding. And um, one of the things that we need to think about while we're talking to Bill is that recipes and cooking, you borrow from your new kin, your new relatives, people, your families you marry into, from your neighbors. That's where our foodways come from. Musicians do the same kind of a thing. Musicians borrow tunes as well as musical styles. And Bill will be playing a blues tune. And uh, I want you to understand that blues is, is a fusion music. It's a fusion of African-American use of European chords and, and African rhythms. That's a very, very wonderful kind of fusion of music. 
So, and that's a definition, shall we say, of, of the opening for a type of music that some folks call white blues. And Bill will perform a blues song that was written by a couple of uh, white boys. And uh, he will, he will uh, be performing this. And so what I want to do is uh, switch over now to Bill Givens. Good afternoon, Bill. Right, nice to see you. Good afternoon. So um, could you tell us a little bit um, about your family and how they came into Illinois and uh, their farming work and what happened to them? Yeah, I actually, uh, I, I, I know more about my mother's side of the family than I know about my, my father's. Uh, my, I know my father's uh, parents came from Marietta, Ohio, and uh, that uh, they were married, I think, in 1896, 97, something like that. Uh, but I don't know much beyond that. My, my grandfather was, was killed in a construction accident in Peoria. And the family, when my dad was born, the family had gone out to South Dakota to, to homestead out there, and that did not work out. But uh, he and his, his brother Vern were actually born, though, while that, that attempt was underway. And I think the story was the, the locusts, basically ran them out. They didn't do well. So uh, I think they ended up in this part of the country because they had relatives here and were staying maybe perhaps, you know, temporarily or something. I really don't know. Uh, uh, in 1920, when, uh, when, when my grandfather was killed, and then this kind of became the, the permanent home area for them. Uh, my mother's uh, father, uh, Bill Page, I'm, I'm named in part for him and also for my dad's father. Uh, first name comes from, from uh, William Page. Uh, he, he did farm work and uh, his family, he was born in Pennsylvania and they came to uh, central Illinois uh, from there. Um, that's the side of the family that I know a little more about. Um, they're the grandparents that I that I did know. They they were still living when I was born, so I grew up around them. And, uh, uh, went to the family potlucks, playing guitar. Came from seeing you know uncles sit and play and, uh, and enjoy music together. My grandfather uh, Bill Page, he was uh, a fiddler and uh, called square dances, and uh, they would. First, hold those, and uh, they lived in Hayworth. He and my my mother was born and raised there, and uh, so a lot of the recipes that we grew up eating came came from that side of the family. Uh, so um, you had a story about uh, the Great Depression and about some of the oh, hard yeah, times they had. It's one that that my my mother told me about, about her parents and her being a young girl and when the depression hit in 1928, work dried up pretty quick. Now my grandfather had a, a team of horses and a threshing machine and uh, that's a big part of how he made his living. I think he also worked at the grain elevator, or I know he did in Hayworth, but I don't know if he did that at that time. I would think that he probably did a mix of things in order to make a buck and feed his family. So. Uh, but at any rate, when the Great Depression hit, work dried up, and um, he became concerned. Was talking to someone at the bank, and uh, uh, they said, "Oh, this thing will be over in a year. It's just a, you know, a blip. We'll be back going like gangbusters again. And, uh, we could loan you money against that threshing machine and uh, a team of horses of yours, and that'll get you through the year. And then there'll be more more, more work next year." And of course, people who know much about the Great Depression know that didn't happen. And uh, was still no income coming in and that money drying up, uh, the bank essentially came and took the threshing machine that left the horses. And my mother recalls she had never heard her mom use bad language before, <laughs> you know, curse anybody or, or swear about them. And, uh, she said the horses were bellowing, making a lot of noise out in the, in the 
stable area and uh, there was no money to buy feed for them. They were hungry. And she recalls my grandmother kind of tearfully saying, why, why don't, doesn't the bank just come and take them? They need to be fed. And my grandfather saying, they, they don't want them either. They don't want to feed them. And my, she heard my grandmother say, well, damn that Herbert Hoop. You know? <laughs> so it became kind of a you know, political statement for, for uh, she heard her, her mother say, and then it, it shocked her and stuck with her because she'd never heard her mother say anything bad about anyone. Uh, so I don't know, that one, that one just always kind of, kind of stuck with me. And, uh, it's a powerful story. Yeah, powerful. it is. Yeah. Would you, would you let us have your tune that you were going to play for us? Oh, okay. Well, this one, you know, there, there are several songs I remember my, my relatives playing at these potluck dinners and, and things. This is not one of them, but it's, from that era, I, I remember my uncle and dad. Nobody sang in the family at that time, other than uh, maybe some of the ladies might sing along or something. But my dad, my my recollections, my dad playing harmonica, and my my uncle Oscar Cotton playing his uh, big old guild guitar and uh, keeping time with both heels of his shoes and, uh, <laughs> and the, the floor shaking. You could sit on the floor in front of him, watch him, and just feel the room kind of shake and. My grandfather, of course, played the fiddle. So they played things like the Darktown Strutters Ball, or uh, uh, there was an old fiddle tune, Whistling Rufus. They played that one. Uh, but this one's from that area. This 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 song is from 1922, called uh, Deep Ellum Blue. So we'll see if I can do it without making too many mistakes. So uh, kind of goes like this. <laughs> Keep your money in your shoes. The women in Deep Ellum got those Deep Ellum blues. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them Deep Ellum blues. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them Deep Ellum blues. Well, once I had a girlfriend, she meant the world to me. She went down to deep fell and now she ain't what she used to be. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them deep fell and blues. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them deep fell and blues. If you go down to Deep Ellum just to have a little fun, have your ten dollars ready when that policeman comes. Oh, sweet mama, daddy's got them Deep Ellum blues. Oh, sweet mama, daddy's got them Deep Ellum blues. Well, once I knew a preacher preached that Bible through and through. He went down to Deep Ellum, now his preaching days are through. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them Deep Ellum blues. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them Deep Ellum blues. If you go down to Deep Pelham, keep your money in your pants. The women in Deep Pelham, they won't give a man a chance. 
Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them deep ellum blues. Oh, sweet mama, your daddy's got them deep ellum blues. There we go. <laughs> That's fun, Bill. Thank you. We're going to be needing to move on to your uh, to Irish Catholic cousins. But uh, before I do that, could you give us just a real brief uh, rundown on bread pudding? Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of one of our favorite desserts. Uh, the actual making of the bread pudding, uh, that recipe comes from Bonnie's mother, my wife's mother, Flora Williams. And uh, uh, but there's a sauce that uh, that we cook separately, and, and you could either take this and pour it over the whole thing, or just spoon it on as you want. But uh, uh, it's uh, one of our favorites, and, and uh, I actually didn't print this out to have it in front of me here to go through the details of making it, but I think it's on the list of uh, items, uh, bread pudding items that uh, you can fix. I, I think that the old original recipe that uh, she had written out from her mother called for stale bread. We didn't do that. It, you know, that was that was a way to use your stale bread is why I think that was, that was written <laughs> in there. And uh, um, so we just, you know, use a loaf of white bread. You could use any kind of bread you wanted, I suppose, and, and make this in terms of a, you know, a soft white bread or a whole wheat bread, something like that. But uh, it's, it's one of our favorites. Uh, the sauce we particularly like, it's, it's a very, tasty caramely kind of kind of thing and uh made with uh, uh with with uh whipping cream heavy whipping cream in it and that so it's uh you could put it on just about anything and it would make it better so okay well i appreciate you being with us today and i hope you're able to stay uh till the end because uh, i do know that some folks have some questions for you okay that'd be great okay thank you sir thanks for having me Well, the Irish famine, the famine Irish, the Irish Catholics, Ireland's population due to famine uh, was decimated. Half, half the folks by Ireland's population went from like 8 million to 4 million in a period of about 10 years. Uh, population literally cut in half. Uh, of those, uh, a lot came to the Western Hemisphere, a lot came to the United States and Canada, people went to Australia, some settled in South America. A huge number, between 1.2 and 1.4 million of these folks starved or died of fever. What caused this famine was two factors. Uh, first of all was the fact that the potato in tight plots of heavily, heavily populated Ireland, the potato was the crop. It's what everybody lived on. And uh, a blight that came from North America wiped those crops out in successive year after year after year. And there was no food to be had. And the food that was being grown was being viewed as an export item. And so not only did Irish people starve from potato blight, but also from the exportation of their foods uh to other countries that is they were exporting food to make money not the irish people but the landlords english landlords who owned the lands of ireland captain edmund wind uh wrote and i want to read this the women and little children were to be seen scattered over the turnip fields like a flock of famished crows devouring the raw turnips mothers half naked, shivering in the snow and sleet, uttering exclamations of despair while their children were screaming with hunger. It was a common sign. And so the Irish left, they were pushed out. Um, they came up to America, about a million. Thousands, tens of thousands died at sea. Uh, some studies have said that the mortality rate 
of these co coffin ships. They call them coffins, because, coffin ships because of the death rates, that the number of people who died on these ships were sometimes equal to that that were experienced on African slave ships. And once they got here, there was really no certain future. What, what exactly would you do, except for not starve, hopefully? Well, many of these folks found their way to central Illinois. A massive public works project, two massive public works projects were going on in Illinois. The building of the Illinois Central Railroad and a building of the Chicago and Alton Railroad. Railroads work if they are level. That is, the tracks have to be level across the land. So if there's a hill, you cut through it. And if there's a valley, you fill it. And so all of that work was done by hand. It was done by wheelbarrows, mule drawn uh, cutters, and the spade. And the Irish male been spading potatoes, a spade type of work all of his life, was, certainly knew how to dig dirt. And so working, working, building the railroads was what brought the Irish Catholics into central Illinois. And I like to say, if you're digging that much dirt, building a railroad, you get to know where the good dirt is. And many of those folks saw this great, rich, black central Illinois prairie soil and figured out we, this is a place to live. We could make it here. And so many of them took jobs with the expanding Chicago and Alton Railroad shops where they could learn a trade, become masters at carpentry, become masters in an iron foundry, uh, become a masters in painting, uh, really do a fabulous job with these. Others found jobs on farms. And, and one of the things that happened was that a kind of apprentice system was shut up, set up where a man could become a hired hand. And then after being a hired hand and really learning to farm in the American way, he could get a tenant. And Isaac Funk in particular was doing a lot of this training of Irish people and putting them as tenants on his farms and then would sell farms to them. And so one of the things that's interesting about the Irish Catholics in central Illinois is that how many of them became farmers. Uh, if you think of uh, Myrna, Downs, and there's other areas, uh, the uh, Lexington area, Tawanda, that has many, many historic Irish Catholic farmers. So that's the work they found. They remained, while they were here, in old country politics. That is, is that they never left Ireland behind in the 19th century. Uh, there was active uh, resistance to evictions in Ireland. Uh, Irish pe uh, farmers would go on strike, land rent strikes, and uh, so they create um, rent strikes and landlords would force people out. And so resistance to those evictions uh, were part of, a, for instance, Panagraph Printing and Stationery Company, owned by the Dolan family, printed handbills uh, on boycotting. That is, they printed, you know, so essentially you're going to boycott a landlord. Bloomington printer would print those and they'd be shipped to Ireland. There were home roof struggles where there were people were participating in trying to support the notion that Irish, Irish Ireland could rule itself. And when it came time for revolution to make home, to make rule, self-rule and actuality, people around here helped raise money for the revolution. And this receipt you see in the lower right hand part of your is a family piece that my grandmother uh, was a bond salesman for the Irish revolution. So she was selling uh, bonds to raise money for gunpowder and guns. While these folks were here, these Irish Catholic, they were not always welcome. Um, their initial settlement, uh, like the Scots-Irish, uh, many Irish uh, Catholics drank whiskey. Whiskey uh, is Gaelic, Gaelic word, I mean, water of life. Um, it was felt that if you could get rid of the Irish, if you simply uh, got rid of the booze. And so Bloomington passed uh, laws making uh, bars and manufacture of alcohol and sales of alcohol illegal. And there were riots, uh, then a whiskey revolution that took place. Uh, the Irish were considered to be voting cattle. The Republicans said that they were uh, stuffing ballot boxes and you couldn't trust them and that uh, the Democratic Party would round up Irish and they'd take them into cities to vote illegally. Uh, the accusations were made here in McLean County and Republican election judges said, no, that actually was not happening. 
um, Irish schools, Catholic schools, uh, were considered to be something that was un-American, uh, that you could not uh, be a Catholic, uh, consider the Pope your religious leader, who is a quote-unquote foreign potentate, and be a true American. And so these, set, these feelings were very strong, and they had a lot of different political ramifications. So these individuals, these families, these Irish Catholic families, had a way that uh, they, they had some barriers, and they, and they saw through them. They, they saw through them. Now, cooking in America for these folks was considerably different. So if you look at the image on the left, um, you're seeing a Irish cabin uh, with an open fireplace for cooking and a single pot or so and a tea kettle on uh, with uh, two women gathered around sharing the stories of the day. There were very few pots and pans, very few knives and forks, very few plates, very few water glasses. These kinds of things simply were not part of uh, the household setups in most of these families. Furthermore, many of these women who were coming over at the time that you would think they were learning to cook, well, there was no food to cook. There was very little food to cook. And famine doesn't develop a cuisine. Famine is a lack of food. And so when these Irish women came and Irish women came separately. The Irish didn't always move as families. They usually migrated as individuals. They migrated on their own. They might, and, and that was true of women. Women came by their own right, under their own power and their own methods of trying to get here. And we found as early in the, before the Civil War, over 50 Irish women were working as cooks in Bloomington hotels and in homes. And so, what was happening is that these Irish women were going from this open hearth cookery and learning how to cook on a stove, and then also learning uh, the recipes that were necessary for the people who were there working for, whether it was in the, a hotel or what, whether it was in a family. And so they were putting together the foods of two different traditions. And in my family, the O'Neills definitely did that. Now, my grandmother, Margaret O'Neill Rogers, learned from her mother, Joanna Nagel O'Neill. And the foods that she served are very typical. And the, um, how do I want to put this? Uh, the source of what is an Irish diet was found in uh, Rob Dirks' uh, uh, book on cookery in the Golden, uh, the Gilded Age. In any case, um, I was looking at those lists, and by golly, this is what my mother was cooking. Uh, corned beef and cabbage, of course, bacon, wheat rolls. We always had rolls with it. Cabbage, yeah. Potatoes, yeah. Soda crackers, yeah. Check, check, check. This is all stuff that was just, you know, there constantly every day. We never had so salt cod balls. Now, salt cod balls is a dried cod fish that has been salted and it's been formed into a ball. And it was a horror of my mother's life. Uh, it was a thing that she would almost cry over when she w thought about it. She talked about how horrible it was. And on Friday, Fish Friday, the cod ball would come out. You know, uh, They also eat dried beef, uh, donuts, dried and canned peas. These very, again, very typical. Mom rarely served, couldn't go through a week without having peas two or three times. The um, way of living was small. They were not elegant in their, their houses. This O'Neill house uh, was built on Lumber Street in 1855. Nine people were raised in that house. So what we're gonna do is uh, listen to and see a um, presentation by Marita Way, who's my sister, who cooks as my mother cooked. And it's really uh, an interesting voyage, if you will, um, to um, see what that was about. And so I'm supposed to do this. Hello, my name is Chris Way, and I'm here today to talk with you 
with my mom, Marita Way, also sister of Greg Coos. My mother's going to talk to you today about some Irish foods that were popular amongst our family growing up at 502 East Chestnut in Bloomington. She will also talk about her Irish cousins, one of whom came to visit from Ireland. Sundays were the days after church when our Irish cousins, the O'Hara's, would come after Mass and bring cream donuts. William, Veronica, Kathleen, and Lillian. They lived there on the farm in Hudson all their life and were born, raised, worked, and they all eventually passed while still living in their childhood home. We had them every holiday, and once a year, William would take our whole family to Mona's restaurant in Toluca as a payback. Sunday evenings were always a pot roast, with potatoes, carrots, onions, and peas. My mom also made the best meatballs. To this day, I still make them. In fact, I had them last night. It's meatballs with mushroom gravy and mashed potatoes and peas again. I like to take the meatballs and gravy and put them over my mashed potatoes. It's kind of like a, a pie. She also liked to make cream chip beef on toast, and she showed me the cream sauce when I was still at home, how she made it. And it was two cups of milk, three teaspoons of butter, and flour until it thickens, and lots of pepper. And she always put the chip beef into the sauce and put it over toast. St. Patrick's Day is coming up, and it brings to mind our family parties and dinners we had all our life starting at 502 and ending up in, in our older years. We always had corned beef, cabbage, potatoes, and lots of good drinks. My mother also tried for a lot of years to contact her cousins in Ireland, and she finally was able to contact a lady who's probably her fourth cousin. Mother and her corresponded for years, and one day she got a letter from her stating that a younger cousin his name was John O'Brien, wanted to come to Illinois to meet our family. Well, he came. There was eight of us in our family, so he would make nine in our dining room table. It seemed like he had a problem passing the potatoes. The potatoes would always sit in front of his plate, and he'd never pass them. And for years after John O'Brien went back to Ireland, the family joke was when someone wouldn't pass something at the table, Dad would say, pass the potatoes, John O'Brien. Oh, that's a great story. I love the way you tell that, Marita. I really do. And now we're going to hear from Representative Dan Brady, Illinois State Legislature. Uh, Dan is a Bloomington lad, made well, attended the same school as I went to, uh, became a funeral director, served as McLean County coroner, and was elected to the Illinois State Legislature in 2000, where he remains today. And Dan is well known for his celebration of his Irish identity in his campaigns. And so, Dan, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for being with us uh, today. And if you would like to, if you could start off perhaps by talking about uh, how you grew up and what you thought about the Bradys and your cousins and, you know, what was it like to, to be a, a Brady, an Irish Catholic son of a good attorney? I mean, what, what was this like? Well, thanks, Greg. It's nice to be with you. And certainly uh, growing up uh, Irish Catholic in this community I was a product of Catholic education, as well as all my siblings, uh, my three sisters and brother. Um, and growing up, um, on St. Patrick's Day, obviously, especially was the, the day of traditions, and there was traditions were many, like you've attested to here uh, already. But one of the things would always be uh, corned beef and cabbage would be at places such as the Knights of Columbus. Uh, Mass was always part of, uh, of the, the day and celebration. Um, and then also, um, growing up, my father started a tradition, Frank Brady, to where um, we would go, he would go with us to uh, the schools uh, whether it be uh, uh, at that time St. Clair Elementary School, Holy Trinity School, or Central Catholic, where my siblings and I would be spread out. And he had a tradition that he would buy um, corsages, Irish corsages and boutonnieres for all the teachers and staff at these schools. And us, the kids, would pass those out. Of course, that was 
uh, horrifying to us children that we had to go see our teachers and give these corsages and things out. But looking back at it um, uh, at that time and then looking back at it, uh, how appreciative those teachers and staff were at the different schools we're at. So appreciative that um, just to pass on that, I took my son, uh, Tom and my daughter, Danielle, and did the same thing at the great schools they were at, whether that be uh, Trinity or uh, Washington School or wherever the, the children were attending and kept the tradition alive for many, 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 many years. And can always remember that if we were short, uh, we always had to get there by the end of the school day to make sure we got a corsage for the teacher that may not have, have gotten one. So that, that was little things. And of course, um, the, the uh, entire celebration of St. Patrick's Day uh, was important. There were many local stops that uh, either my father or as I got older, myself and began a political career, career would make. Um, some of those stops were in the basement of the old Mike's Market for a, an Irish gathering um, and different spots throughout the community uh, that I would, would uh, stop by. And I, I think growing up also one has to remember that um, the grandparents that have been attest, uh, spoken to about from uh, those that have talked earlier uh, were very, very important. Uh, my grandmother, uh, Margaret Downey, and her, her husband, Dan Downey, uh, railroad family themselves, Irish immigrants, um, and grandma would have a number of recipes that uh, handed down. In fact, I believe we have one that's going to be shared uh, of uh, Irish soda bread. That was a, a tradition and special with Grandma Brady that passed down to the generations, or Grandma Downey, too. <laughs> the Brady's. Um, and, and so with that, um, that molded my future as far as the Irish history. Um, and um, I can always remember that um, growing up uh, St. Patrick's Day and what it meant to our families and our traditions that were passed down and uh, from generation to generation and that we try and keep alive today. Well, I understand that your father had a particular uh, fondness for corned beef that uh, he carried to the end of his life. He did. My dad, uh, Frank, uh, as you alluded to, a longtime attorney uh, here in the in McLean County um, and, and uh, political uh, uh, himself. That's where some of my I believe some of my politics. In fact, I always say that my, my dad was vice president uh, of the Republican Party in McLean County or vice chairman. And my grandfather was at one time was chairman of the Democratic Party in McLean County. So I come from my politics very honestly. But dad uh, loved, um, loved to eat, uh, as many of us do. And as he was nearing his days here on the earth and in hospice and on, on his uh, deathbed, or what we thought was very close to the end, many of us uh, children that were there said, dad, is there anything we could get you? And as we kind of thought, um, he, there was really nothing and he was kind of coming in and out of consciousness, uh, he opened his eyes and said, well, a corned beef sandwich would be good. <laughs> and we all kind of stared at each other and, very surprised and starstruck and it hit me, where are we going to get a corned beef cabbage sandwich for dad or corned beef and cabbage or at least a sandwich for dad. And then it dawned on me that my good friend and colleague in the state legislature, Representative Joe Lyons, a good Irish Catholic Democrat from the south side of Chicago, had a history of feeding uh, Harrington's corned beef sandwiches to the, to the legislature on St. Patrick's Day. Well, we uh, weren't close to St. Patrick's Day, but he made certain things happen and within a very short period of time uh, was driving down uh, to Bloomington with corned beef sandwiches. Uh, and so we were able to provide, thanks to my good, my good friend at that time and, and former colleague, Joe Lyons, um, a corned beef sandwich for dad uh, before he uh, uh, left us in this world. And, and that, that was something that was really, really special to us and will always be remembered. And I think it's, it's things like that, that uh, when you talk about politics shows you uh, um, how important it is to, uh, to, to work uh, together and not only understand the heritage of all your colleagues and friends and what their, uh, what their exposure in life is, of what their uh, experiences, their backgrounds, and what's traditions in, that are important to them. Well, I appreciate you being with us, Dan. You know, your story about the corsage brought back a memory that I had lost. And that is when I was third, fourth, and fifth grade, my mother would give all of the Coos boys and girls a little Irish corsage that was made out of green wire as a shamrock and a little tiny clay pipe in the middle of it. So when I go to school, I go to school like this to put my, keep my hand over it. And the nuns would say, well, Mr. Coos, we've already done the pledge. I says, yes, sister, I know we have. So, well, why is your hand there? Well, I, I don't know, sister, why it is, you know? And so I have to take my hand down and there'd be this 
damn thing. <laughs> well, as, as, as you, as I have become a parent, uh, many of the things that my parents did now, I understand much, much uh, better uh, <laughs> reasons why they did what they did. And then I, I've had a history in the last uh, 20 plus years of having a pre St. Patrick's day gathering from the political side of things. In fact, we just, uh, we just uh, had that gathering uh, very, very recently here. And that has seen um, everyone from who's a candidate from school board uh, to uh, presidency of the United States and members of Congress and the legislature and uh, township government school boards. And a big gathering the other evening um, was, was uh, accomplished that evening. And of course, um, the, the uh, picture of uh, that I most recent picture I have of some of the politicians that were at the bar that particular evening with the quote that said, um, I'm telling you, surely none of it is a lie. And so <laughs> that is very much Irish heritage right there as well. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for being part of this. Are you going to be able to hang out for some questions, you think? I'm going to be able to hang out for some questions and bring in my historian himself in the future uh, of the Brady generation, Tom Brady, to carry on many of these traditions. Happy well, St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Dan. And now we're going to speak with and listen to Bill Williams, uh, Cincinnati. Bill is an Irish historian and folklorist and has written numerous books. Uh, of the ones he's written, my favorite is Twas Only an Irishman's Dream, Images of Ireland and the Irish and American Popular Song Lyrics. Uh, he's presented these kinds of music to many different audiences uh, across the United States, and he's involved in two different bands, and one of them whose name I cannot present. So, uh, Bill? Okay. Um, we need we've got a song here. A, we need a camera on Bill. Okay, we're um, off. There, there we you go. go. That's better. We got a song here that mentions uh, at least two of the three main potato dishes that the Irish like to cook champ and Colcannon and Boxty. So this is Colcannon and Boxty with a lot of uh, nostalgia thrown in. <laughs> well, did you ever make Colcannon made of a lovely pickled cream where the green scallions mingled like a picture in a dream? Did you ever put the hole on top to hold the melting flake of the creamy flavored butter that your mammy used to make? Ah, you did, sure you did, so did he and so did I. And the more you think about it, sure the liquor and the cry. Oh, wasn't them the happy days and troubles we knew not? And our mothers met called Cannon and the little skillet pot. Well, did you ever take a pancake or box tea to the school? Tucked underneath your oxter with your little book and rule. When teacher wasn't looking, so a great big bite you'd take. Of the creamy flavored, soft and melting sweet potato cake. Ah, uh, you did, sure you did, so did he and so did I. And the more you think about it, sure the never I am to cry. Wasn't them the happy days and troubles we knew not? And our mothers met the cannon in the little skillet pot. Well, did you ever go a courting, girls, when the evening sun went down? And the moon was peeping softly from behind the hill of down. And you wandered down the boring with a chloroconnel scene. And you whispered loving phrases to your own dear sweet Colleen. Ah, you did, yes you did, so did he and so did I. And the more you think about it, sure the nearer I am the cry. Oh, wasn't them the happy days and troubles we knew not. And our mothers met called Cannon in the little skillet pot. And our mothers made called cannon in 
the little skillet pot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful tune. Thank you. Uh, I assume that we will hear that on recordings across the nation. <laughs> <laughs> So question remains, where's the patty cake? So I just wanted to put this in at the end before we go to our questions and back to Julie. Essentially, patty cakes, it is a potato, mashed potatoes that's mashed together as a patty and uh, fry it and uh, put some egg in it, fry it and in bacon fats, my favorite way to do it. So there's uh, actually that photo was taken last night from patty cakes that uh, Carol made. And so back over to Julie. Thank you, everybody. That was enjoyable. I got up and did a little jig. <laughs> um, the first question we have is for Bill Givens. Did your family in Hayworth live near Irish Row Road that ran through McLean and DeWitt counties? You're Bill? muted, Bill. You're muted. He's got it, yeah. Uh, I don't have the exact address of where they lived, oddly enough. Uh, when one of my older brothers, when he was still living, my brother Bob came back to visit and my mother, of course, was still living at the time. We drove down to Hayworth because he wanted to see where the house he had been born in. And uh, uh, so we make this trip and we're sitting outside the house my mother grew up in, which is not where Bob was born. And Bob's looking at this. This was kind of a nice two-story house. And mom was talking about the cistern in the attic and was her and her sister Beulah's job to, to pump the two-handled pump and, and one of the other kids would be up there making sure to tell them when to quit when it got full enough so they'd have running water in the house. And she was, there was a man working on a car outside the house and he walked over and wanted to know if he could help. And, and uh, when my mother explained why we were there, he says, let me get the wife, you got to come in the house. So we go in and get the tour. So I actually got to see the house from the inside my mother grew up in, even though her, her family left there many years ago. Um, and even stand in the room, bedroom where my brother Roy was born uh, in that room, uh, my, my oldest brother. So that was, uh, but exactly where the address is, I, I, I don't know. I'm guessing that, uh, it's, it's the page, if somebody knew the page family there, then, then that's, that's probably where it was, yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so another question, where is Mike's Market? I'll take a shot at that. Okay. <laughs> Our Dan, unless Dan was there too. Anyway, Mike's Market was run by the Canaries and I was on a corner of Park Street and Empire Street, the yes. uh, south east corner. Um, Mike's Market was better known than Illinois Wesleyan University because one of the things that Minor Myers, the deceased president of that university, would, had observed is that when people gave instructions on how to get to Illinois Wesleyan University, they'd say, go Route 9 to Mike's Market, turn right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, and also in there, Greg, was, uh, my, uh, was uh, Mr. Cable's, uh, the Cable's Bakery which was yep. uh, down uh, or back in the back end by the meat counter area, if I remember. So it was, uh, it was quite the meet and greet place. And uh, uh, there was uh, a lot of fun gatherings over the years in that basement on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> um, do the Irish celebrate St. Patrick Day St. Patrick's Day here in McLean County. Um, I understand that it isn't a big deal in Ireland, but Americans have run amok with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, Greg, Greg certainly knows uh, the history uh, of the celebration and is you do hear that it's more prevalent, obviously, here uh, in the States. Um, all I know is that uh, even in this, this challenging time of uh, COVID, uh, there's still a few parties that are going on this weekend and celebrations St. Patrick's Day, and I'll be going to one at Crawford's Pub as soon as I leave here. <laughs> Good place Thank to you. gather. When I lived in Ireland in the 1960s and early 70s, uh, St. Patrick's Day was, was definitely not a big deal. There was a 
an industrial parade, if you can believe that. And there wasn't that much industry in Ireland. But the main thing you had to know was that the only bar open on St. Patrick's Day was in the Royal Dublin Society, which always held its dog show on St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. And so the story of uh, Brendan Behan, the well-known Irish writer, uh, coming in desperate for a drink and encountering these enormous Irish uh, greyhounds uh, or Irish uh, wolfhounds sprawled across the floor and he picks his way across and says, where did all these blankety blank dogs come from? <laughs> <laughs> Since then, uh, I think there has uh, the, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is now a fairly big deal when they're able to run it because so, so many tourists come over for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll never forget watching the um, in Chicago, the, the water turned green <laughs> to celebrate. And in Boston, uh, there was a, a school holiday, evacuation day, I think, that was really more about celebration. <laughs> Than anything. So Julie, I'm old enough where I recall when the Chicago River was always green. Oh, well, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I'm scanning for additional questions. Oh, okay. In terms of Mike's Market, let's see. It's across the street from where the columns entering IU are now. Cool. Early on, the original grocery belonged to Arthur and Kate Armbruster. Yeah, Art Arm, Arm Buster, Arm Brewster. Arm, <laughs> Arm Brewster, Brewster. apologies. Um, we used to call him Arm Buster. You know, I grew up <laughs> in that neighborhood, but uh, he, um, he was one of the great um, Chicago style, I should call him, now he's downstate style, uh, precinct committeeman, dedicated Democratic Party mm -hmm. precinct committeeman. And he would always wear a, uh, what he called his L. Smith Derby. So you knew it was politics time when Arm Brewster would put on his, his derby and hit the door, you know, for, uh, for his signatures. And it, it, I remember answering the door and he says, you've got three good Democrats in this household, bring them out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, just to remind you to everyone, this is being recorded and it will be available on our uh, museum YouTube page. So you are free to access it in the future at any time. Yeah. So my, my question and, and the final question today for any one of you is if, if you, when you reflect on the Irish immigrant experience, in this country generally, but really here in particular, is there something about it that is distinctly unique? Well, I, I think about what's unique about it is um, everyone claims to be Irish on St. Patrick's Day. And, and I think it's a, a <laughs> sign of fellowship, um, of coming together, celebration, good times, remembering those who have gone before us, uh, toasting those who have gone before us, uh, and just, just a time of, of camaraderie of, of whatever your, your background is um, and understanding over good food, good drink, and good friends. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that it was the maintenance of cultural identity. Hmm. Um, a sense of, uh, of Irishness being present you know, throughout m many, many generations. And um, what drove that is possibly the forced removal, where the notion of going home or being connected to home uh, was so important because home had been taken away from you. You had been pushed out. Mm -hmm. And so it always becomes even, you know, uh, it become people have what I call, I've got it, Ireland in the mind, you know? Yeah. Nice. Thank you. This has been so enjoyable and informative. Um, I'm sure you all have access to the chat and we're getting a lot of positive comments. For everyone out there, our next uh, series presentation is April 13th, this time back at 6 p.m. And it is called Sava Kasava, The Roots of Congolese Cooking uh, with Chris Callahan, the professor of French at Illinois Wesleyan University and Patrick Lubala, um, a friend of mine whom I got to know very well uh, when he was doing the Multicultural Leadership Program. And he um, 
is Congolese. So I'm really looking forward to that. Once again, you can access this online. And we, let's see, is there anything else I need to say? I don't think so, other I, than enjoy just, your Saturday. Yes, Greg. I would like to thank the Bills. I'd like to thank everyone for being part of this, uh, for their participation in this. So thank you, folks. Thank you for having us.